All right, so now we're back on the microphone. So I started to tell you that I have this whole, I don't know if it's a pet peeve, but I know this is a business podcast, but I wanted to get on the mic with you and talk about all the things that parents, including myself, are going through with you know college decision-making, where they're going to go and the ridiculous amount of money you have to pay. And then I watched that movie on HBO. Was it HBO? Or uh, Netflix? Netflix. Netflix about this whole college scandal yeah, and it just pissed Varsity. me off. It just pissed me off because forget about the rich people, the poor. I mean, it's just a big game and the colleges are controlling the whole thing. They got us all sucked in to this whole process. Right. Well, right. And I'm going to share with you shortly when that starts to happen and how it happens and how you can prevent it from happening. Good. So at least for all the parents out there, I mean, I got, I got my third one. I could still work on hey. Hey, but but don't fall into the trap, right? Right, but but there's one way for parents not to fall in the trap. Another way is for the kids, because like you said, this is a business entrepreneurial podcast. Right. Well, guess who? What's your daughter's name? Layton. Well, Layton Enterprises starts <laughs> September first. Yeah, that's for sure. For four years. Yeah. It is her business, her brand. My message to her as all the kids is take care of business. Yeah. Approach this as business. From a parent standpoint, what we'll talk about shortly is approach this as business. Yeah. How do you take back the ownership? You approach it as business. Okay, good advice, good well, advice. I'll, sh I'll get into how to do that as soon as you're ready. I'm ready, you take me through it and then I'll ask you questions and jump in when well, I hear well, stuff. Let's Let's just take a practical example. Okay. You're going to take your daughter on a college trip today. We're going to go visit the beautiful University of Maryland. Oh, you wake up in the morning and you say, hey, uh, hey, it's our day today. We get to go away. It's going to be great. We're going to have fun and this and that. Sure, that's all fine. Now you get in the car and you start going there. Now you get to about 10 miles away from the campus and you look at your daughter and you go, hey, are, how are you feeling? Are you excited about this? This is going to be great. You're going to love this. You're going to love that, all this stuff. And I say, get away from the hype. <laughs> that's the parent's mistake. Right. Get away from the hype. You're 10 miles away from the college campus. You have one question to be asking yourself as the parent. How much does Do this I cost? Uh, what? <laughs> How much does this cost? Oh, well, you hey, should know that ahead of time. Well, do I want to do business with this college? Right. For four years. I'm coming to see if I want to do business with them and to see if I decide to do business with them, what kind of outcomes can I expect? Okay. In other words, jobs, internships, all these things. What is the experience going to be like? Right. So now for the 10 miles leading into the campus, this is not a hype. There's no hype. It's let's go take care of business. You say to your daughter, hey, we're going to go to the admission office. Take your questions with you. Hans just gave you 13 questions. Take them with you. We're going to go in and you're going to ask the questions. We're going to find out how they do their business in the admission office. Okay. If we want financial aid, like you gave me an example earlier, Layton, while, you, while you're in the admission office, I'm going to slide over to the financial aid office. I'm going to ask them this question. If the net cost is 50000 and my EFC is 20000 Right, which is what the, that's what your student aid report says you should be contributing, right? Based on whatever information they have on you. That's right. That's, right? that's based on the FAFSA, strictly based on the right. FAFSA. The second you hit that submit button, this, this algorithm, yeah, it goes uh, bananas. I know it's crazy. What is EFC? Expected family contribution. Okay, it's ex okay. That makes sense. Expected family contribution. Right. That's nothing to do with whether you can afford it or not. That's it's not evaluating that. It's just expected family contribution. It's the number that determines if you are a qualifier. Okay. A qualifier is a legal term. Net cost fifty thousand. EFC twenty thousand. I am by definition a qualifier. The difference. Yeah. It's called demonstrated need. Okay. So now you have a $30,000 demonstrated need. Now you can go in and you could have gone in two years ago, let's say, and just go and say, hey, hypothetically, <laughs> net cost is 50,000, 
EFC $20,000, $30,000 demonstrated need. How will you meet right. my need? Right. Do you Can you meet the need? Right. How will you meet That's it? the biggest miss. So you ask, how will you meet it? And they'll say, oh, yeah, we'll meet it. Well, how? Right. Well, they don't know how. They're just told to say that. Right. So, and when the time comes, they'll offer a $30,000 loan and say, see, we met your need. We yeah, right. There you go. Loan. Bingo. Ching, ching. Yeah. So you got to pay that back, though. So follow me on this. Okay. She's in admission office asking her questions. The number one question she's going to ask is, what's the maximum scholarship for which you can offer? And whatever that person says, because everybody in the admission office has a maximum. Okay. Let's say the person says the maximum is 18000 Okay. Well, great. What do I have to do to get it? Because I'm not coming here without it. You know, once they let that cat out of the bag, I'm not coming here without it. So what do I have to do to get it? So now you know what's happening in the admission office. You know what might happen in the financial aid office. And then let's just say... Uh, your daughter wants to study medical sciences. You go okay. over the medical science department, you know, the biology, biology, chemistry. You go meet somebody over there and you start to ask them questions. Now, let me interrupt you for a second because yep. I don't want to forget this. Let's go back to the financial aid office for a second. Yep. I have heard because there's, you know, the parents post and they all that universities now are shying away from these kids who have financial need because they want the full payers. Is that true? Well, Mitchell, it's a hundred percent true. Yeah. And yet every single one of them, do you, do you remember 20 years ago, all these colleges were saying, Oh, we're, we're need blind. Right. They still say that in a lot of cases. It's bullshit. Yeah. They're right? getting away from saying it because they're not. Yeah. Cause they don't want to get caught. And when you look at private schools, did she apply to private schools? She applied to Wake Forest, all Miami. Right. And- all right, so and, you had to yeah. file a CSS profile. You had to fill out and and submit a CSS profile, right? Yeah, I believe so, yeah. Yeah, you did. And you know what that's for? To negate financial aid. Right. To see. Now, it serves that purpose. But imagine this. You had to do it before your ap- daughter's application would be read. Right. It's a condition of the admission office. When the admission office requires this full financial disclosure, because that's what it is. Yeah. They have total access to your your wealth position for right. determining, really, your uh, ability to pay. Right. And there is no question behind the closed doors of the boardroom in the admission office, they're all targeting full payers especially now right because especially they had a now. lot of other costs and all kinds of other problems with covid and everything especially now yeah. they are looking and targeting full payers now a school like yale might take in a couple of uh dis- financially disadvantaged kids give them a big financial aid package and say see we we meet need at 100 percent. we gave right. these three families fifty thousand dollars right each well, they're cherry picking, they're managing, they're manipulating, and they know what kids can do this and what kids will do this. So now they ramp it up with this early decision process. Yeah, they have early oh. early action, early decision. Now they have two levels of early decision, ED1 and ED2. And ED2 is a scam, by the way. Yeah. It, because, well, ED1 is too, but that's <laughs> ED1 is strictly a sales and marketing strategy of the college. That's to lock you in, right? If they say you're in, you got to go. Well, you don't have to, but they say that. Right. Say you have to go. Early decision. Oh, we'll give you an early decision. What does it mean? You have to make the deposit by February 1st, not May 1st. Right. So now they say you have to make a deposit in January. A family makes a deposit in January. What's next? The guidance counselor calls you in and says, now you have to cancel out all the other applications. Right. Because you you went ED, right? You don't, you don't have to cancel out anything. You're, you paid, you paid the application fee. You're entitled to find out what happens and you're entitled to make a different decision later. You are, you are. 
You sure you are. What are they going to do? They, they can't they can't blackball you. They can't throw you in jail. There's a caveat. Can in they the withdraw your admission? Can oh, they? No, no. You've, could the other schools deny you admission because you turned down an ED offer? No, because they have no way of knowing. So what do guidance counselors in high schools say? Yeah. Oh, they talk to each other. No, they don't talk to each they other. They don't? How can they? They don't have time. They don't have resources. I thought it was like reported or something in a database, no? No, no, okay. and nobody's looking and nobody cares. You know what they care about? They care about, we care. give you an ED, you're gonna pay us full and you're going to say yes. And by the fact that you're gonna say yes, our conversion rate of acceptances into enrollments is way high. Right. That's a big deal. And we just maxed out an entire pool of full pay. Right. Jeez. Now, if you, so if you have a, if you have a low EFC, and therefore, there's a big gap between tuition and what you're expected to pay. Are they not going to accept you ED because you're not a full payer? Because they better meet that need or then you're not going even if you're accepted ED, right? That's when you get the letter. And I've seen hundreds of them that say, oh, I'm, they say this every year. I've seen it for 15 years. This is the most competitive application class ever. Right, as they always say. That's what they say. Yeah. Right. Oh, what does that mean? It means... We're going to deny your application. Right. Oh, you have impressive credentials. But we're very sorry to inform but you. But we're very sorry to in inform you. A lot, you know what they did this year? A lot of the kids from out of state for these state schools, they got waitlisted, they got bumped. If they told you that they were score, you didn't need to submit a score because maybe you couldn't take the test because it was delayed. They still deferred you, waitlisted you. They just right off the, and they've admitted that to some of the guidance counselors I know. They were supposed to be, blind to it, but they're not. No. And I think the important lesson here, Mitchell, is that this is a managed process. It's a business for them, right? A hundred percent. Hey, yeah. there's a term for it in the college system. It's called enrollment management. Right. Well, that's so how they, they get trained. Yeah. They get trained on enrollment management. Yeah. It's called sales. Sales and marketing. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. Right. Yeah. It's sales and marketing. And it's very frustrating as a parent. And I and I got you. The, the, it's frustrating as a parent to, to maneuver this thing when basically you're playing in a game, right? That the other guy knows all the rules and controls the board and you don't even know what your pieces look like. That's right. It's their game. Yeah. They own the rules. And Mitch, they don't have to, sh when they change the rules, they don't have to share them. They don't. They don't share anything. They don't share anything. And the frontline people in admissions and financial aid, they're trained to defer and deflect the parents. No, we don't do that. No, that's not our policy. No this, no that. And what do parents do? They go, well, I guess they don't do it. That's too bad for us. Yeah. Go, no, it's not too bad for us. I mean, it, it, we, we can't accept that for us. Right. So I, one of my students today from Ecuador, we were reading a letter uh, that she got accepted at a great university. Well, it's got to help coming from Ecuador. They probably don't get too many. Yeah. So you know what the letter, this is from a great university. Right. Private school though. says, okay. oh, but we don't offer scholarships to international students. Really? Why? Well, what's the difference? So, so that means you have a policy. This is 2021. Get rid of the policy. What a stupid policy. Sounds discriminatory. Bingo. Yeah. I said to the family, I'll tell you what I'm inclined to do. I'm inclined to send a letter to the school president and say, look at this letter your your office just sent out. Shame on you. This is discriminatory. It's tough enough on these kids. Right. Now you're going to make it tougher. So that gets me, uh, that really gets me irked. We, oh, it's, we don't offer scholarships to international students. What kind of nonsense is that? Because they think a lot of the foreigners can pay the full boat. They want them to pay the whole thing. Yeah. They're just, they're just trying to manage all of it to maximize their, now, hey, we all wish that we could run our business as good as they do. You can improve, you increase your prices every year. Government gives you more money. Automatic. You don't even have to ask for an increase. You right. just post it. The thing is, colleges have mastered parents' behavior. They know how parents will react. 
They know if their child loves the pizza in the gourmet cafeteria that they just shared with her on the tour. Right. And the, and the or, or the dorm room is beautiful or the sports facility is beautiful. They know that if the child comes to the parent and say, wow, this is really great. That the parents just wants their kid to be happy, right? Parent, they're they're right. all hooked. They're, they're hooked. Big hook right in the back. I asked parents, how'd that feel? How'd what feel? It's a big hook. Big gaff that you got. Big gash right in the back, <laughs> right in your back. Boom. They just right. got you hooked. Yeah. So let me ask you this question. So I like I'm already in the process, right? So my daughter applied to several schools. She got deferred or waitlisted a lot of schools. She got into Maryland. She wants to go there. So I don't have, like, what do, what do parents listening who are already in the process? They, they weren't with you at the beginning when they pulled up to the school and went to the financial aid office and got all the, they didn't know, like, I didn't know. Right. So what, what, what can I do now that I got a kid who Zuri put a deposit down and now we're, what do I do? Well, there's already, two they things. told me that they won't give me any money, even though I'm entitled to it. Yeah. Well, so there's two things. Why this school? What, what, what is it about this school that makes sense? So I was on a call yesterday with a family and a child was make, wanting, you know, making a commitment to a school. And, and, I, and I, I said, what, really, what, what is it about this school that makes any sense? Well, a friend of mine was there and she was in a sorority and it was- Right, there's no logical. Well, what happens if that's the only school the kid got into? Well, then that's a bad strategy on their part. In terms and, of the schools that they chose. Yes. Yeah. Then I say, well, you might want to rethink. Maybe we should start in January. Maybe we should apply to other schools. Maybe we should start at a community college instead. Do a community college for a year because right now you don't have a plan. So you can evaluate the plan right now to see if it makes sense. It's the college that's chosen, chosen for the right reason. So if this girl had said yesterday to me, hey, this... This school has the best science department, has great research opportunity, has internships, they're well connected to the hospital, they're this and they're that. Hey, I'm a buyer. Right. If the, if the student says, well, you know, it's, it's fun and it's sorority and this and that, I'm not a buyer. Parents, you can't just buy <laughs> regardless of the purpose. But they do. They want their kids to have fun and this and that. It's hard. They do. So as long as that's the way parents are going to be, then you're going to get the outcomes that come with it. Right. So what can parents do right now? They can at least ask, besides asking the question, uh, let's just say in your daughter's case, she's made, a decision's been made. And we right. don't, let's just say we don't want to disrupt that. Right. Let's say, say okay, that. let's evaluate the study program. Let's correlate your interest in studies to your possible career interests. Let's make sure there's a correlation and let's get ready for it. What can we plan on for the next four years besides taking classes? What can we plan on to make sure our goal or ambition is achieved? Yeah. And set out with a four-year plan, uh, a four-year plan for classes, a four-year plan for internships, a, a three-and-a-half-year plan for uh, 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 interacting with the professors, uh, and, and connecting with what I call the academic community of the college. Right. If you're going to study science, hey, be the right-hand person in the science department to your favorite professor. Right. Be in there, be volunteering. All of a sudden, before you know it, you're brought in on research assignments or community activities or events or study abroad opportunities. Before right. you know it, Mitchell, your, your daughter could have a, an, uh, an option maybe to go uh, somewhere overseas for like right. two, between your first and second semester, maybe a Costa Rican trip, maybe a Spain trip, who knows? But there are a lot of things that you can be doing besides just taking classes to right. make sure you, you have the full experience. Right. And then in the end, you get the right outcome. We have to plan four years, Mitchell. That's the one thing parents have to insist. That's the business of it from a parent standpoint, four years. Right. Graduate in four years or no deal. Or you do it yourself. Yep. Yeah. And then and then you're building a resume, really. Right. I mean, because you, it's not just like you went through and got good grades. You actually had real life experiences and things. That's that taken did. back to your business entrepreneurship. That's taking care of business. Right. Right. If you if you want to apply for jobs without uh, in, uh, without your basket of skills and abilities and knowledge full, 
then hey, go to Amazon and, and apply for one of their $17 an hour jobs. Nothing wrong with it. Just go do it. But don't go to college and spend $250,000 <laughs> for that. For that. Right. So so we have to build upon these things. If a student says to me, oh, yeah, I want to be a doctor. I want to be an engineer. I want to be whatever. Why? And, and where is the basis for it? What, in other words, what have you done up until now that shows anybody that that's a, a serious passion or interest? Or what are you willing to do? Are you willing to have a blog site? Again, you're branding yourself. So if you're going to go in, if you're going to college to have fun, hey, you don't have to do any of that stuff. If you want to go to college and get a, a, a desired outcome achieved, then treat it as business. You're an entrepreneur. Your your daughter is entering the world of entrepreneurship. Yeah. On September one or earlier. Yeah. No, she's pretty. She wants to go to medical school, and she's wants to do like, you know, journalism and uh, English and stuff undergrad. So she's got it pretty worked out. My son, he didn't know what he was going to do. He ended up in the informatics program, which is a good, you know, good program. He's got a good. He'll have a chance well, to get a job. Be- there has to be a lot of why questions right. from mom and dad or whatever to their child. Why right. does this make sense? We have to get kids to access deep their internal passion, not on the surface. Oh, it sounds good. Right. No, let's dig down in deep. If somebody says the medical field, they want to be a doctor. Okay. You don't have to tell me what kind of doctor you're going to be. You're not even really going right, to you're gonna figure that out. Medical school doesn't matter. You're going to figure it out in medical school. school. Right. That's what it's all designed for. But where's your passion? Well, is it that you, you, you want to help sick people? I mean, is that really what your passion is? You think that we, you can help improve the healthcare system? What, where, what is your passion for this? And, uh, and are you willing to go through all the, all the trials and tribulations to, to eventually one day, whether you're, a doctor or you're an APRN or in or a PA any of those levels because once you get to those levels you're going to have an income all your life right of course you better love doing it because if you don't it's hard it's hard when you love it yeah so now if but if you're a parent and you didn't go down that road and you have a kid applied to a couple of schools you got into one of them you don't really have a lot of leverage when it comes to finances, right? Because you got no other options. Nope. Yeah. Every every student of mine required by me is to submit an in-state application. You have to create that baseline. If you're in New York, hey, it could be Binghamton, it could be Stony Brook. I don't care where it is. If it's Pennsylvania, it can be Penn State, I don't care where it is. If it's Connecticut, it can be Yukon. I don't care. You may not want to go there. I don't care if you want to go there or not. But create that baseline of cost that for which you can always compare. Because if you have, if you have, a, what state do you live in? New Jersey. Oh, New Jersey. So let's say you have Rutgers at thirty thousand dollars. Yeah, which is not cheap for a state school. No, well, it's a and it's a quality state. And that's in state, right? Right, that's in state. So. Yeah. I would say to you, Mitchell, what, what makes Maryland worth $100,000 more over four years? That's yeah, a hard question 20, to answer. Yeah, right. It's about 55. Yeah. 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 It's going to cost an extra 100000 What makes it worthwhile? And I would ask the, the child, why should parents pay an extra 100000 100000 Right. Why should they pay an extra? Well, I don't want to go to Rutgers. Yeah, I don't want to stay in New Jersey. That's how a lot of kids feel. Hey. I, I hear the same thing in Connecticut. I hear the same thing in New York. I hear the same thing in all these states. Well, they want to get away. Well, right. but at what cost? A hundred thousand? Really? A hundred thousand? Yeah. That's got to sit here and make you wonder yourself right now. A hundred thousand. That's a big number. Now, I'd like to go to Maryland, except it won't do any good right now. And it probably wouldn't have done any good. But to say, hey, look, I can be at Rutgers for 30,000. Why would I pay 55? Right, because well, a lot of the state schools don't have the funding that, or they claim they don't, to meet needs, as opposed to private schools, which have more endowments and money and and so forth. They don't want to give it up either. Nobody wants to give it up, Mitchell. But they'll all give you a different reason why. Right, and and it's they're all reasons that a frontline person 
uh, are, is told to say. It has no, no bearing on authenticity. It's these frontliners who, let's face it, they're not making anything more than 40000 a year. Right. Are just told to say. Yeah. It's, yeah, I know. You yeah. know, when you call a financial aid department and somebody answers the phone and you say, well, I'd like to speak to one of the aid officers. They're like, oh, you could speak to me. I'm one of the aid officers. I'm like, why are you answering the phone if you know? Yeah. It That's $15 make any sense. an hour. Right. That's a $15 an hour person and and they've just been trained to say yeah say things because they're trained to deflect parents just deflect them just tell them no go away no go away and then they'll go away right most people parents will say oh it doesn't work oh i called and they they said this or said that who's they tell me who said that a frontline person answering the phone this is again a business podcast where in business do we just allow right. the frontline person to tell us things? Yeah, it's terrible customer service. It is. Yeah. But yeah. they know parents will just, okay, yeah. that's the way it is. Okay. Oh, they're the big university, I guess. Uh, they know what they're talking that's about. That's the way they do it. Well, Intimidating. Yeah. Now, this whole, now, this whole scandal, the Varsity Blues uh, operation that they caught this guy, First of all, it, show, it shows the desperation that these people have who have money to get their kids into this, these seemingly top universities. But I got to believe that they caught this guy. It's got to be a lot of other people doing this on in below the radar. Well, he, he, he's like Bernie Madoff, you know? Yeah, he, exactly. He had a little niche. The, the, pro, the difference is Bernie Madoff's victims were victims. They were unaware completely yeah. unaware right these now, people these, were total participants they knew what they are on. total participants when you, you put your what? kid in a pool and make it look like he's playing water polo I mean, and on. not even knowing the polo players don't stand right. yeah how could, how could you get your body that far out of water when you're in a pool that's like 30 pool, feet deep the pool is right <laughs> they have to tread water the entire time right now, what that show did really good job of is the strain and the conflict on these people's faces and minds who are making these decisions. Wealthy people, successful people, right. they knew that it was wrong. They were scared, what will happen if I get caught? And how embarrassing will that be? And yet they turn around and do, do it anyway. Yeah, because but, but this guy conned them into saying, oh, everyone does it. This is the way the game is played. This is oh, I know he, he referred to it as, oh, yeah, it's a side door. We're coming it's in right. the side door. Now, here's here's a couple points. Number one, I'm glad they all got caught my, because my kids work hard. I right. have kids at USC. They work really hard. But here's the other point. If you have to pay that kind of money. Yeah. That should ring a bell, right? It should ring a bell that kind of says maybe your kid doesn't belong there. Right. You can't just buy your way into USC. That's a very highly rigorous uh, university right. and think that they're going to be able to stay there. And they couldn't get in to begin with. You can't get in to begin with. There's a reason why. <laughs> so therefore, you should be looking at something else that's yeah. not, not as rigorous. But... Now, these parents are a little bit of a microcosm of the rest of the country. Right. Even though the other 98% of the country, parents, are not paying to do that, they all want to make that great Facebook post. Oh, yeah. Look where my child Right. It's all vicariousness. It's all vicarious. And it's all about them. It's the one thing they have in common. It's all about them the parents and it's never about the kids right but they've implanted that in the kids minds like you need to go to these top schools what is it top 15 is like where everyone should go but that's a tiny percentage of the student population that even goes to those schools do you know my my daughter wanted to go to california i knew she wasn't going to go get in but she applied to ucla and usc they had ucla posted that they had a hundred and six two thousand applications this year that's absurd Right. And, uh, and so how many uh, admission counselors do you think they have? Yeah, not I, enough. <laughs> I don't want to do I don't want to do a math exercise right now, but let's right. just say they have 50 of them. That means and they don't. But but that would mean each one of them. Still, that's over 3000 applications each. 
Right. So you know what they want to do? They want to say no within one minute. Of course, I want to get it off your desk. And if you're out of state anyway, they're putting you in a little pile anyway. But yeah, I can't imagine. It's hard when you got 50,000 applications. They all want to say no within five minutes. Right. It's our job to keep their interest on the application beyond five minutes. The director of Yale said to me, we want to be done and off of it in five minutes. That way, my counselors can get through 12 of them in an hour. And at 12 an hour, $75 a pop, that's $1,000 an hour income. Yeah, but that just shows you how you're working, your kids are working for four years, and then they spend probably a year and a half or more putting together their resume, visiting these schools, taking the courses, and they give you five minutes? Five minutes. And that's then, crap. yeah, and then... If I asked you or any other parent, if you were in their position, how, how much time do you want to spend on an application? And you're sitting Well, they there, don't care. They're getting hourly paid. They don't get commissions well, based on who they get. Okay. But, okay. But this is why my strategy of applying early pays off. When you apply early by, let's say, August, uh, uh, September 15th. You don't mean early decision necessarily. I don't mean, I, you know, I just mean apply right. early. There's some schools that are rolling. It's all different, right? Yep. Then you, then you go in that queue with very few people in front of you. That queue gets evaluated in, let's say, in early December between Thanksgiving and Christmas. Now, that's when the counselors are sitting there and they don't have many. Uh, right. They're, they're not fatigued. Many. They're not overwhelmed. Right. Right. So they're looking and they're interested and chances are they know who you are and they want to say yes and they want to do that. They come back after New Year's and they're stockpiled with dozens and dozens and they are overwhelmed. They're going, oh, my God, they hate it. So. Right. They find every reason to knock a kid off the pile as quick as they can. Right. Unless you're coming from a school that accepts 90 percent. Right. When there are schools that accept 90%. And then they're just in a minute's time, accept, accept, accept. Right, then they do it quicker. But I also know some of the private schools, the guidance counselors work the admissions officers and they network with them and they talk to them. So if I, they get a resume from you, they get a kid from you, they go, oh, hand sent this over. I know he sends me quality kids and then they give you more. I mean, it's a game. Well, think about this game. Who do you think the pawns are in all of this? The pawns are the guidance counselors. They don't know it, but they're actually working for the colleges. They're actually conveying the college message. What the colleges want to get through to you, the parents, they use the high school guidance counselors to of deliver course. the colleges. Got a whole field sales force for free. Absolutely. And I, I don't know if there's ever been a single high school guidance counselor who said, Mitchell, you're going to go visit colleges next week. Be sure you stop by the anticipated department of study. Right. They won't even say stop by the admission office. They'll they just say, even know you're going. Yeah. They'll just say, and if, but if they know you're going, they'll just say sign up for a tour. Right. Because that's what the college wants you to do. That's, that's how they get the quick hook in. Yep. So they're just promoting the, 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 the power position of the colleges over the parents we have to just bust that up well that's what i think i think parents like i think this is all too overwhelming for them they give up they it's like you know you, you got someone with a foot on your neck and you're just like all right fine i'll just do it your way and they don't you know it's it's frustrating as a parent and i'm pretty well educated about it and it's frustrating hey, look i'm i'm fairly well educated about it too but uh my daughter in her second semester at Penn, a second year at Penn State, second semester, second year, she started off as a business major. Uh, uh, March comes around and I, she calls at 830 in the morning and I see her number come through. So as a parent, you know, you're going to be quick to pick it up. And Mitchell, you know, when it comes to our daughters, we can tell in three seconds time if this is a good, happy call <laughs> or a distress call. Right. Dad. Dad, oh my gosh, I'm not happy in my major. I just visited the career center. They think I should change majors. Oh, I go, Kelly, just do what you want to do. Just right. do it. Of well, course. What did that do? That cost me $50,000. Because it extended her? Yeah, by two semesters. There you go. 
yeah. and 50,000 yeah. cash out of pocket. No, my son was a business major at Indiana and he switched to informatics. That was my first question. What does this do to his graduation track? Can he still do it in four years? They say, yes. I said, all right, then do whatever you want. But I'm doing four years, Hans, and then I'm out. And think of this. I hear parents say, yeah, but that's what the career center suggests. I go, well, who does the career center work for, by the way? Right. Yeah. An extra year is an extra. Yeah, that's money. Their job is to extend the terms. If they can get a student to change, that's why they always call you in second semester, second year. That's when the changes usually occur. Because they know at that point, it's probably too late. It's going to at least cost you an extra term. Right. Yeah, because if you're already into your core classes. You're you missed. Started into it. Right, right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And yeah. if they do it second semester of their freshman year, they're not going to get any extension of terms out of it. But every time they can get somebody to change, not change within the major. I mean, if you go from business marketing to business finance. Right, you're not going to lose any time. No. But if you go from business to science or science to engineering or, or any of these types of things, then uh, then you're likely a semester behind. Yeah, because you didn't do your core requirements in that. Yep. So you have required. Yeah, you have to go back and you got to do those. And they everyone costs money. So that's all by design. Changing college majors is by design. What about when parents say, uh, oh, I was at an information session on a college tour and they said, don't worry about knowing what your major is. Right. They always say that. Get here. We'll help figure it out for you. Well, now you just signed up for the five-year plan. Maybe the six-year plan. <laughs> signed your death warrant. Yep. Now, and you how, think the par- the, these people get trained like that? Most definitely. Okay. How about when somebody in an information session says, oh, we have a 90% job placement rate. Yeah, what does that mean? I always felt that was like, it didn't sound right. Well, how about if one person ever says, geez, how do you track that? Right. Well, you know, the person's going to be stumped. Well, we'll No, they were told it. They were told it. Right. Now, hey, Mitch, there's not one college in history that's ever been anywhere near 90%. I was never contacted by my university. Asked me if I got a job yeah, or whatever. Just, just All made up. Yeah. Next time you're on a university, say, "Hey, where's the department that tracks job placement rate?" Yeah. Oh, no department. It there's doesn't no, exist. No. The, the only resource that will contact you, obviously, after you graduate, is the alumni association. To they ask want you your money. money. Right. Of course. So. Well, you think if they ask ten people and nine of them got jobs, that's a ninety percent. You can extrapolate that. You don't need to ask the 30,000 kids that graduated. Yeah, but uh, three of those jobs might be at, you know, be be a barista. It also could change in six months. Serving coffee. Yeah. Right. And we love our baristas, but uh, but they still won't. Yeah. yeah, they had a great stock option plan, though, at Starbucks. <laughs> Well, you don't have to pay three hundred thousand dollars in college costs to, to right exactly to say do you want fries with that. That's so, a lot but, of money. But Mitch, the, here's the thing: I get in front of a group of parents and I ask them, "What do they tell you is the job placement rate?" And parents are quick to say 90, 92, 94, 90, whatever. It's always ninety plus. You know, at least ten years ago it was eighty plus. Now it's ninety plus. Right. And I ask them, "How did it make you feel when you heard that?" And what do parents say one after another? It, it gives makes, you confidence in the school, right? It makes me feel that college is worth it. Oh, my God. They just pulled. They just gaffed yeah, you here now. Here you go. I'm going to take money out of my pocket. Oh, Give it my to gosh. It, it's just right. like, just, you know. Smart. You know what? You know why that's such a, a, a really a, a wasted statistic? Because we know that the success that people have in their life has no correlation to where they go to college, sometimes if they go to college. So the fact that a school has a 90% job placement rate out of graduation is totally meaningless. Totally meaningless because three months later, they could be unemployed again. I, you don't know. But it's a good selling statistic. And it's fake news. Yeah. Well, it looks it's the good. ultimate yeah. fake news because like you just called it a statistic. A statistic is supposed to be data, fact, 
checked right it's supposed to be supported by data that's what a statistic is i mean you can't say in the nba the guy averages 30 points a game if his real average is six points a game right. <laughs> yeah i mean there's got to be data that's right that's, it. yeah I, you know if you threw 40 interceptions last year in the nfl you can't come out next year and say i threw four right i forgot the other 36 exactly. because there's real data behind it but colleges throw these things out they're trained to say it and and they think that if they say it parents will then buy it right well it's a sales pitch right it's a sales pitch by somebody who is a vendor service provider who has the power position over the customer who's not really educated I mean, the customer knows the basics, but they don't know what all this stuff's going on behind the scenes, how they're manipulating you and, you know. Because you can't win this game from, if you play it from the parent perspective or the high school perspective, which is the guidance counselor. You can only win this game if you play it from the college perspective, because it's like you said in the beginning, it's their game, they set the rules. Yeah, you gotta beat them you at their own game. Know how they play it and then we have a chance but this is this is a game i did a talk a couple weeks ago for a large soccer organization i said how how will you how would you play the game different if you started off the game behind three nothing and they yeah, your whole strategy would be different your whole strategy would be different exactly and that's i said that's exactly what you're doing the moment you decide to enter this game called college the arena You're behind three right. nothing in soccer terms 20 nothing in football terms yeah yeah and how are you going to play well you're going to jump in if you're behind you're going to jump in with a little bit of urgency and 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 determination you won't just sit back and just let the game continue on let time go by right and let's see what happens well what game what game is have we ever played i mean i played racquetball match last night i'm not gonna win it if i'm just waiting to see what happens right of course not that's not how you win sports and i got behind early and i had to make adjustments and i and i wound up winning in the end but it's it's a game it, it, it we, we we have to be good at it right so okay so if you're a parent and you got some foresight right and you can apply to a bunch of schools some of which you know you can do well with and get in and then you can kind of play them off each other and ask the right questions and keep your mind of yourself. Don't get crazy about the big, what's the one at Penn state, the hub. Holy shit. That's like a, it's like a shopping mall at a university. That's a huge selling point. I don't know why they, they have the it, creamery, but... the creamery. Oh, boy. oh yeah. We went to the creamery too. When we were there. You get yeah. a line. It takes an hour. Sometimes it's ridiculous. It's true, just Cause to... that's what you need for $250,000 to send your kid to a creamery. So, but that's my point. So, so if you do some planning ahead and you, you, you do some research and they talk to somebody like you, they have a, a fighting chance, but in, from a societal standpoint, like that's my biggest uh, issue is like, well, where do we go from here? We get, we have these universities, they're off the rails in terms of, you know, and they raise more money and they don't lower tuition, they raise tuition. And then they put up like art museums and graduate programs and, and you're just paying for this stuff. So it's still going up. The loans are still going up. How do you, it's going to burst at some, how do you, at some point people well, are going to be like, I'm not spending half a million dollars to send my kids to school. Well, here's the, here, here's the bottom line. Colleges were just given a kitchen pass by parents across America on the COVID situation. Right. Colleges were in turmoil a year ago. They were on tilt a year ago. They were scared half out of the wits that nobody would show up on campus in the for the fall semester. Right. Parents finally had the upper hand all the way through July, like uh, the Brown University President Paxson. She was scared out of her wits that nobody's going to show up. Right. All of a sudden, it's August 1st. And all of a sudden, parents across America, they go, hmm. Well, my kid wants to go, I'm going to take her. I'm going to take him. And all of a sudden they all gave into it. 
They went back to their old ways. They all went back. Yeah. They all gave into it. And and colleges were given a reprieve. So the one time for four months, parents had the upper hand and they were asserting it. They all gave it back. So what do we do? Do we pass legislation? Do we make the schools be more accountable? We, do we put caps on endowments that Harvard can't have a $36 billion endowment when, they, when they, they're when they charging kids tuition? What, what do we do? How about Harvard having a, a, an endowment like that and accepting a, a government bailout money last year? $10 yeah, million. right. That's what I mean. I mean, Harvard hey, has Mitchell. such a big endowment that they could let kids go for free for a very long time and not even touch their print the print. But they won't ever they won't ever do that. No, I know they won't. So how do so, you get them but, to but lower here's, costs? Here's that's a delicate question that you asked and here's the delicate answer. As long as parents are willing to buy on student appeal rather than student outcomes. Right. This is going to continue. Right, logical versus emotional decision making. Right. Yeah. So we have to, as a collective group of parents nationwide, we have to demand outcomes. What are you going to do to get the outcome? Where's the resource center? You know, hey, Mitchell, how many college graduates graduate today without a LinkedIn profile? Yeah. The vast majority of them. Oh, we have to have a resume. Oh, we can put one of those together quick. Yeah. One, I, could, I can say one good thing my son did when he got to school is they made him set up a, a LinkedIn profile. I don't know if he's used it since. Well, also, you said that it's a good thing. Okay, now I'm going to just it's a start. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to tweak you a little bit here. <laughs> you're, you're either LinkedIn or linked out. Right. Yeah, you're either connected or you're not. If, you're, if you have an account and you haven't built it out, then you're linked out. You're better right, of off course. not to have an account. Yeah, because then because if people go look and they go, go look and they oh, see he's got twenty nine con- connections. Who's this guy? He's not doing and anything. Not even a picture. And right, there's no photograph. Freshman at University of so and so, you just shot yourself. You know how many people I've looked up? If I see that they have totally an inactive por- you know profile, they got thirty contacts and no picture. I don't. I turn them off. You, right. So all these schools they make you in, in your first business class to create an account. If, if they don't make you develop it, it's counterproductive. You're better yeah. off not to have one. But it should be an automatic thing. That's my point, Mitchell. There's got to be a job resource center on the campus where everybody has to cycle through. And right. when you cycle through it, you you build out a LinkedIn profile. You, uh, you, you have a quality resume, not just something you just throw together that doesn't have any flow to it. Right. You, 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 you learn minimum technology that you got to have to 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 navigate the world ahead. You got to have a job resource center. These colleges need to streamline the educational process. Yeah. And, and, and get students to their destination, their desired destination faster. Why can't you have a business degree without 45 credits of nonsense? So that somebody I agree. can graduate. I agree. Well, well that's because, Hans, that's because they want your money. Oh, so they I, said I, you need 130 credits to graduate or whatever, and you really don't. You could do it in two or three years, but their job is not, not it's their job. Their focus is not, hey, let's take this young adult and let's educate them and get them ready and get them a job and get out there, whatever they want to do. They no. are selling this whole experience, you know, and that includes yeah. going overseas and taking arts courses and all- and protecting the those professors' ability to get paid. Right. But yeah, because nobody offering- would be taking most of those courses if you didn't require them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, COVID taught us something about uh, you know pe- people who could go out in March, and April, and May. They had they they had to have a purpose of going out right uh we should have learned that classes need to have a purpose right and if they don't have a purpose then they don't have relevance or they don't have purpose and they don't have relevance they don't have a basis for existence they'll make kids take these classes just because they don't want to lay off the professor the tenured professor 
and they can't lay them off. So we got to make sure. Is there tenure at the university level? Yes. Okay. My, my niece at a good state university had to take anthropology and archaeology in her first semester freshman year. I said, that's, that's absurd. And uh, I Was she an archaeologist? It. No, she's going to be a bi she's studying biology. She wants to become a vet. Okay. So I changed it three times to relevant classes. Well, then at the end, a month ahead of time, they called her in and said, we want you to take these classes. Were they so requirements? They yeah. School made them requirements. They said, <laughs> by the way, they're going to be easy classes. You'll get it. Right. Oh, yeah. So basket like, weaving. Right. Okay. Okay. I'll do that. Right. I'm going, oh, my God. Do you realize you just paid for you just paid six credits for what we paid for the semester. Uh, Forty percent of it went to these two classes. We there was a class at, at the school where they told my son, if you take this class, it's an easy grade. It was billiards. Like pool. Right. I'm hundreds of dollars of credit for him to learn how to shoot pool. Because somebody's getting paid to teach it. And they have to protect that person's ability to have have the class have people paying for the class yeah that has to come to an end parents have to be able to say when you're looking at your daughter's schedule this is why i suggested you got to look out two years so that you know what the two-year progression right. is. you need like a business plan of sending your kid to college right we can have a a one semester business plan a one year two year four year plan, but we got to map out classes for two years so that you take the classes that you want and you don't wind up getting pigeonholed on classes that you have no interest and no relevance and no bearing on your major. Because you're just trying to meet your credit requirements. Well, that's right. Yeah, the whole thing, you know, I think it, it this whole COVID thing really kind of lifted the hood on universities and what was going on. And I, I, I'll be honest with you, I, I don't think the parents care. I like, I, I don't think anybody's going to, yeah, they, they, they gave it all. They back. had the chance. And, they, and then this varsity blues things come out and you won't see anything change. Nope. Nope. No. Nope. Now two years ago when that came out, it was exciting times. And I mean, in my, my cell phone oh, yeah, it was great lit, news. Up that, lit up that night, I got 15 or 20 calls and texts and everything. And, but do and, you think if they weren't famous, like aunt Becky from full house, that it really would have made that much, it probably would have been gone in a couple of, you know, in a week. Oh, it was the famous people. And and they're entitled, like they're entitled, you know? Yeah. Hey, and, hey, and, and frankly, I think the outcome, instead of a two month uh, embarrassment sentence is all that is. Yeah, basically. If they had charged uh, each of them a $20 million fine, which was pennies to them, uh, and, and took the $20 million and multiplied it by 60 or 70 or 80 of them, You'd have a, a billion and a half worth of dollars you could put into a scholarship fund for disadvantaged. Yeah, there's kids. no question about it. Sending those people to jail was a waste of our taxpayer money. Like, what the hell are you Total doing? Waste. They should be paying a huge fine for doing Just it. Just pay $20 million. They would right. have done it like this. Would have been a great fund. Uh, yeah. Right. And, then, and then have somebody manage that and delegate or distribute funds to disadvantaged families across America then it, that's a, a little bit of a redistribution of wealth that yeah. would have come out of that. And that that could have been beneficial. Instead, yep. they sweep it under the rug, get a little get embarrassed by it. Of course, they're embarrassed by it. But and, and then this guy, Gary Singer, he's still out. He's the other guy. Well, Which Gary guy Singer, was he? he? He's the he's the guy who uh, headed up the whole con. Oh, is he? Yeah, because he's still pending trial right there. He's on a, what, like home? He's got an ankle bracelet. Yeah, that's not. Yeah, but he goes anywhere. And as long as he keeps feeding the federal government names of the people that he right. works with, exactly. they're, you know, they're, yeah. they're not going to do anything with him. So anyway, uh, they could have had a better outcome. Uh, th that getting exposed is a, is a good thing. Yeah, uh, it's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, and... But I don't know if parents are going to learn. They're all looking they know they for a way to beat learned. the system, but they don't learn, you know, because well, they get they learn. fall prey to the pressure that they have from their children who have this vision of where they want to go, as opposed to saying, listen, we're going to approach this like a business. 
I mean, look, I couldn't get my family to do it either, right? They went to all kinds of colleges. They were all excited and this and that. But we're going to approach this like a business. What are we paying for? What are we getting? What do you want to study? What's a good place where you can have a good education and get a lot for your value? Because I don't think fifty thousand dollars. I don't think any educational experience should be fifty, eighty thousand dollars. It just hey, shouldn't be. Mitch, the simple question to you: What are you willing to pay, and what do you expect out of it? Right. What yeah, that's really what every parent should be asking. Right. What do you want out of it? What do you expect out of it? And mm. when parents say to me. Well, my kid deserves it. What? Two hundred and fifty thousand dollars worth. And why don't you give him two fifty? Yeah. Give him two fifty, and then he can do something. Your kid deserves for you to bankrupt yourself over this, right? End up in debt till you're well into your retirement. Yeah, I don't think that helps anybody. So, it's that. No, because you know what's going to happen. The kid is going to have to take care of you when you get older. Hopefully, they have a good enough job, and now they got you to take care of and their kids. It's, it's a terrible cycle. Okay. Vicious. I, I spent a month in my Facebook group, my College Clarity Facebook group, uh, a couple months ago talking about the real crisis of America are the unemployed college graduates. Yeah. That's the real crisis. And one of my segments that month was a really interesting fact that said, if you start off right out of college in the wrong job, you have like an 80% likelihood to still be in the wrong job, even if it's your third one by the time you're 30. Because you're trapped, you're like on the wrong yeah. path. And yeah. it's hard to get off the path, right? It's hard to get off the path. Yeah, that's 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 crazy. Well, I'm sure we could go on for a long time, keep talking about this. Um, well, but I have some things to do. I got to be on a call at five and I appreciate it very much. So and, but if people want to learn from you and get in touch with you, how do they, how do they get in touch with your hands? Right. Simple, easy email, H A N S at mycollegelogic.com. Thank you for asking. Join my Facebook group called college clarity. Just come in and join it. And then you get a little taste of what we do and how we do it and the issues that we have. And of course, my website is mycollegelogic.com. So I, I welcome anybody to, uh, to to reach out to me on an email. I'll give them a free call. Uh, one one thing I just want to kind of like close with a little sure. bit. It, it might seem like we're bashing colleges. Probably from my perspective, I'm bashing the parents who have allowed it to happen. Right. No, the, the colleges are feeding on what we're allowing uh, to be That's done right. to us. They're running a great business they know their customers better than anybody else and the customers is the parents through the kids through the kids yeah that is like a magical business model right right well look television discovered that on saturday mornings in the old days you could put an ad on they would say why well mom's not watching why we let's put the kids well if you get to the kids the kids are going to beg the parents to buy it. So That's what happens exactly with happening. youth soccer clubs? Right. Youth soccer clubs start with kids like five or six or seven years old. That whole concept of the parent doing anything and everything and pouring money towards their kid starts yep. at a young age. Uh, and it just... It's a very good business model for the people on the other end. Very good who, business Who model. understand that they're getting the parents hooked through the emotional interest that you of don't want to be the bad parent who doesn't allow your kid to do whatever and experience everything in your life that maybe you didn't have or and we've been on that treadmill since our you know parents in the 50s because then not everyone went to college now everyone goes to college and graduates i mean it's crazy so but hans i do appreciate it thanks so much for your time and you know people should definitely get in touch with you because they got to Turn the tables. Got to get control gotta, of this whole situation. You so got to take back the power. You got to turn the tables, take back the power, and and take ownership of your own outcome. If 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 you don't do that, then you're leaving everything to chance. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks, Hans. Thank you. I appreciate you, Mitch.